Our first reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And it's the words of Moses, if I've got this right. So, See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him, for that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 1 responsibly. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on God's teaching day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff, which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall be destroyed. <clears throat> Our second reading is from the book of Philemon, which this is the majority of it, I think. Paul, a prison, prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become, during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. 
Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able for our gospel. Alleluia, alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends, grace, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Imagine coming to church on a Sunday morning and reading an entire book of the Bible. In fact, you just did almost. I don't know. Pastor Louie is here. Have you ever read an entire book of the Bible on a Sunday morning with your congregation? I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes preachers can be long-winded and the lesson can go on, but this morning, though, we read almost the whole book of Philemon. So for the sake of completion, I'm going to read you the missing verses from Paul's letter to Philemon. One more thing, wrote Paul in conclusion. Prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's it. Barely 335 words in the original Greek, the letter to Philemon could almost be an ancient text message or an email. It's probably still too big for a TikTok, though. Scholars universally agree that Paul actually wrote this letter. It's not just a letter attributed to him. But we don't know a lot of details behind the letter who all of the characters mentioned were, where the letter was written, or exactly when it was written. But it's clearly an appeal on Paul's part for one of his companions, very dear to him, a person named Onesimus. His name actually means useful. Onesimus, useful. 
He's a slave or a servant. But what is most important is that Onesimus believed in Jesus. And he became very dear to Paul. Paul calls him his own child because he believed. Philemon, his master or owner, is also a Christian. And he's thought to be a, a wealthy merchant, perhaps, of the town of Colossae, who's also a friend of Paul. Paul knows him well. And he might even be a really big benefactor to the church. So when you heard Marjorie read that letter this morning, when you heard the conclusion earlier, how did that letter strike you? What, what did you take away from it? Anybody care to share what they heard in that message? I figured it'd be pretty quiet. I ask because it's kind of like we're eavesdropping on a personal conversation. Like we opened a letter that came to our house by mistake. But it's in the Bible. And the church has used this very short letter the same way it uses Paul's more wordy epistles. Because this letter shows how one's identity in Christ transforms one's life. Transforms one's life. Most of the commentary or explanatory notes that you have in your Bible probably focus on the transformation of Onesimus. Because he's transformed from a slave to a brother. He has become family. And that transformation happens in Christ. It happens because of Jesus. But Onesimus is far from the only one transformed. Martin Luther called this letter an example of holy flattery. Holy flattery. And you could hear that in some of Paul's tone. Luther wrote, Even if Philemon were made of stone, he would have to melt. He would have to melt. Because the book of Philemon is truly a love letter. A love letter. Love, as Christianity teaches, is the totality of one's being. God is love, after all. Love is who God is, and we know God and God's love through Jesus Christ, and so love is who we are. Love is who we are. Paul's letter is an appeal, writing on behalf of Onesimus based on love as the only way to draw Philemon into the ever-stretching net of love. Did you catch that? Philemon. Philemon, the slave owner, is the one outside and being drawn in. Paul's appeal to love draws Philemon in. And love moves him and transforms him. We don't know what happened after this letter. We don't know what happened with Philemon, with Onesimus, with Paul. All we have is the letter. And the book of Philemon, sadly and terribly, has been used to justify slavery. Not that long ago either. But to do that is to misread terribly the message here. Because in this love letter, Paul shows how slavery dehumanized both the slave and the slaveholder and the owner. Christian love has the power to transform each, to, to turn and transform dehumanization into reconciliation and rebirth, as it were, to become a family, because Christian love does that. And only Christian love has the power to do that. Slavery was and is an evil practice. But Christ overcomes evil. And Christian love 
overcomes evil. If love is what you're looking for this morning, you found it in Jesus. You found it in Jesus. A love that is unlike anything else. A love that will change you. It will change you, transform you. It's a love that will bring you to new life. And when the love of Christ is shared, it can even change the world, like it could for a slave and a slave owner. That triangle formed by Paul and Onesimus and Philemon we get to occupy that triangle too as we seek to live in peace and in love and reconciliation together. While we have turned in many ways Christianity into a religion of self-gratification, Paul's letter to Philemon is about focusing on Jesus Christ and the other and doing that in love so that all can be transformed and have life. When Paul called himself in this letter a prisoner for Jesus Christ, we see a transfer of identity from personal to a new identity of being possessed by Christ, bounded against his own will and purpose even. Paul made it clear that his work and his living were in service to Jesus Christ and the love that claimed him. That shift in identity entreats a poignant question to the 21st century church, to us. Is our ministry for God or simply for self-aggrandizement? No doubt you know the answer to that. You do know the right answer. Our ministry is for God. Ministry is not based on tolerance, but on human dignity, the human dignity of all. And as such, based on human love and dignity, Paul pleaded with Philemon to accept Onesimus, who was once useless, but now has become useful, he says, as a brother in Christ. And Paul pleaded with Philemon, to be the brother that Christ made him to be, to truly be the loving family of God. A family where one is no longer a slave, but free. A family where one is no longer a slaveholder, but free. The book reminds us of who we are, sisters and brothers in Christ. The book reminds us of who Christ is, the one whose love transforms us. The book reminds us of who we are, loved ones in Christ. The book reminds us of what we do, love others in Christ. And the book reminds us of what happens. We are transformed too. From slavery to freedom, and dear friends, we are even transformed from death to life, a new life that we can only find through the love of our Lord Jesus. As you worship today, as you hear the word, and as you receive the sacrament, be loved, beloved, be loved. Thanks be to God.